Hello everyone and welcome to Dutch Greybeard. In November 2023, the magical moment had finally arrived for me to start reading Robin Hobb. Back in the day when I bought my books in the bookshop, I always checked if there was anything new by William Horwood, my favorite author. I remember wondering at the time who this Robin Hobb was, whose books stood next to Horwood's. The covers of his books looked intriguing, though I never dared to take the plunge. Starting my journey into fantasy, I learned that Robin Hobb was a favorite of many booktubers and that he was a she. It didn't take very long before her huge series, The Realm of the Elderlings, populated my TBR bookshelves. One of the appealing things of this huge series is that it is divided into four trilogies and one quadrilogy. This gives readers the opportunity to take a bit of a breather after a trilogy, other than The Wheel of Time, where the entire 15 books form one huge story. I'll keep this reading experience free of spoilers until the end. There I will reveal one spoiler, but don't worry, I'll warn you well ahead of time. So within one week in November, I had devoured Assassin's Apprentice, which is the first book in the Farseer trilogy, which subseries kicks off the realm of the Elderlings. This novel is a coming of age story about a boy who initially doesn't even have a name. He is the bastard son of Prince Chivalry Farseer, growing up in Buck, one of the six duchies that together form the kingdom. His caretaker, Burick, is fair, but harsh with him. He calls the boy Fitz, a name that sticks. Later on, Prince Verity, the brother of Chivalry, will name him Fitz Chivalry Farseer. Fitz grows into adulthood, learning a great deal of the political intrigue within a royal family. As a young boy of six, Fitz vows to serve King Shrewd, and in secret he is tutored in the arts of the assassin. His apprenticeship and his education in the skill, some sort of magic that bridges thoughts from person to person, takes Fitz into new places and many dangers. Another form of magic is the wit, which enables people to communicate and bond with animals. Hobb is known for her excellent character work, and I can only agree with that. Almost all of the characters are written with very realistic depth, detail, and contradictions. They develop through the tribulations of life in a natural way. The only exception for me was Prince Regal, the half-brother of Prince Verity. In the first two books, his character remains a bit one-dimensional to me. He's the bad guy, and it looks like there's nothing much more to his character than that. In the third book, however, even Regal becomes more layered and even understandable. Because I already did a video on this first book, I won't spend too much time on it right now. I loved it and getting acquainted with Miss Hobbs' writing was simply wonderful. Her writing is very inspirational, and it stirred my own writing muscles to come into action. Even though the first two-third of the novel is a bit slow-paced, there is still very much going on, most certainly between the lines. The final third of the book builds up to a finale that is simply amazing. For the last 150 pages, it was impossible to put the book down. I give Assassin's Apprentice 92 points out of 100, a very solid 4.5 star. After finishing this first book, I immediately picked up Royal Assassin, book number two. This one took me 22 days, which doesn't say anything about my enjoyment. The first half of the book, again, is very slow paced. The intrigues within the royal family of the Farseers continue and Fitz finds love. The raids of the red ships on the east coast of the six duchies require more attention. Verity decides to leave Buck to try and gain the help of the legendary elderlings. Nobody knows if these elderlings truly exist, nor what they really are. 
With Verity gone, Regal gets more leverage to work his plots, which results in the seemingly defeat of Fitz at the end. In this book, Fitz bonds with the wolf Night Eyes, which results in many beautiful pages of prose. It's one of the most famous animal companions in the whole of fantasy. On a market, Fitz bargains to buy a mistreated and caged young wolf without knowing what to do with the animal. At first, Fitz calls him Cub. The wolf is understandably filled with hate towards humans. But every day that I did not strike him, every bit of food I brought him, was one more plank of trust in the bridge between us. After about 100 pages, Fitz finally bonds with the animal, at which point the wolf tells him that his name is Night Eyes. Hub poignantly portrays this bond, where the wolf regularly wonders why the human makes such a fuss over things. This is it, brother. We are as we are. How can you claim to know what life I was meant to lead, let alone threaten to force me into it? You cannot even accept what you are meant to be. You deny it, even as you are it. All your quibbling is nonsense. As well forbid your nose to snuff, or your ears to hear. We are as we do, brother. There are also some memorable dialogues between Fitz and the Fool. When Fitz says that he and the Fool are mere pawns, the Fool replies, This, more than anything else, is what I've never understood about your people. You can roll dice and understand that the whole game may hinge on one turn of a die. You deal out cards and say that all a man's fortune for the night may turn upon one hand. But a man's whole life you sniff at and say, what, this naught of a human, this fisherman, this carpenter, this thief, this cook, why, what can they do in the great wide world? And so you putter and sputter your lives away like candles burning on a draught. What good is a life lived as if it made no difference at all to the great life of the world? A sadder thing I cannot imagine. Each creature in the world should consider this thing, every moment of the heart's beating. Otherwise, what's the point of arising each day? The pacing of the story was very slow, but Hobb is known for that, and it didn't really bother me. This was simply another great book. I gave Assassin's Quest 93 points out of 100. In between book two and book three, I read some other works like Tagana by Guy Gavriel Kay and The We Free Men by Terry Pratchett. But on New Year's Day, January the 1st, I picked up Assassin's Quest, which turned out to be my favorite of the bunch. In this closing volume, many things happen. And I hardly at all experienced drag the way I did at times in the other two books. The whole time I anticipated big reveals, which would make me understand more about the world, the elderlings, the wit, and the skill, and the reasons behind the raids by the red ships, and how and why they forged people and more. And even though a lot still remains clouded at the end, the essential parts of this story are beautifully wrapped up. I highly admire the way the author writes how Fitz, who in the beginning is more wolf than man, has to learn how to be human again. He cannot relate to the doings of humans. They talked long, long, long of things that had nothing to do with eating or sleeping or hunting. When he is handed a mirror, it says, he gave me a round glass with a man in it. Many of the described emotions are so real when Fitz is reminded of the way he was tortured by Regal's thugs, he's not angry. I felt shamed at what Regal had done to me. That is real. Even though I spent 22 days with this novel, every reading session went by in a blink. There's a lot of getting captured and escaping, a little bit too much perhaps, but it kept on fascinating me. And every page was a joy of prose such a skilled writer, like this sentence, in which Hobb, with just a few words, displays an image anyone can see. He smiled at me, 
the smile of a man who knows how the tumbling dice will fall before they land. From the moment Fitz and his party reaches the city of Yampa, there is a continuous tension in the air of walking towards an epic finale. There are many heart-gripping scenes and dialogues. For instance, when Fitz confesses to the minstrel Starling that he is not in love with her, she sighs and says, I know that, and you know that. But it was not a thing that had to be said just now. Fitz emphasizes that he does not want any lies, spoken or unspoken, to which Starling replies, I'm a minstrel. I know more about lying than you will ever discover. And minstrels know that sometimes lies are what a man needs most in order to make a new truth of them. The book does not end with any big revealing moment. The story gradually progresses in the appointed direction and once there, things can be wrapped up. Not that it's not impressive or overwhelming, it's just not very surprising. Robin Hobb is not only a master in writing characters, she is also a genius in writing closing sentences. The final sentence of this book is so beautiful and so profound, just as the closing lines of the previous two books were. This book I gave 94 points out of 100, so the overall score for this trilogy is 93 points out of 100, which is a high 4.5 stars. In closing, I would like to illustrate Hobbes' skill of writing closing sentences, but that is mildly spoiling for those who have not read the books, so... Because Fids has pledged himself to King Shrewd as a young boy, he is always in the king's service. This steers him more often than he would like into territory or actions that he would never choose if he were his own man. But being the king's man, he sometimes feels as if his life is being lived for him. The bond between Fitz and Night Eyes, which takes place around the middle of this trilogy, develops in a fascinating way. Regularly, either Fitz or Night Eyes lose some of their own, and Fitz becomes more wolf than human, and vice versa for Night Eyes. Night Eyes lives in the here and now, and is free from intrigue, guilt or responsibility other than looking for his next meal and a place to sleep. This becomes obvious in the final pages of Royal Assassin, the second book, when Fitz transforms his soul from his human body into the body of the wolf. He is forced to take such a drastic measure when his tortured body is about to die. Now his consciousness can survive while his body dies. Fitz is tempted to stay in the wolf's body and become wolf altogether. Here are the closing lines of this novel. Leave the pain behind and let your life be your own again. There is a place where all time is now and the choices are simple and always your own. Wolves have no kings. There's an entire world in these last four words. Thank you very much for watching this video. Until we meet again at Dutch Greybeard. Mm -hmm.